Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the Sunday School lesson for the college class for July 5th. Christy says hi. Silently, she waved. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, last week, we did the story of the blind man. <clears throat> and on this first slide here, I have the first and last verses of that chapter. Um, this was uh, Jesus, the whole thing there where who sinned, and we talked about that. And then it appears that the story is intended for us to think more than just physical blindness. Because the last verse of the chapter says, if Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Um, so something about their seeing was not good. They thought they could see and they couldn't see. And then we finished the lesson reading Isaiah 35. So I've got a piece of that that we read. I've got in red on the slide here um, the eyes of the blind portion of um, this section of Isaiah 35. Uh, <clears throat> Sarah sent me a text. Did I tell you that? Mm -hmm. um, she loves that chapter. Uh, so, hi, Sarah. So, um, uh, I mentioned last week um, how Jesus responds to John the Baptist. I've got that verse on the bottom in Matthew 11. It says, now when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by, by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one? Or should we look for somebody else? And Jesus answered and said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. Lame walk, lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear, dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's going to be part of this week's lesson. But I put some other places in Isaiah that have this idea. Um, I just want to read just these short sections here about the blind, just to kind of get get to thinking about, um, you know, I, I would really, it's my, it's my heart's desire to, to be thinking about what, you know, Matthew and John are talking about and the way they want me to think and talk about it. Um, I don't, I don't want to, to create some, system of understanding um I, I want to try to understand what they're saying on you know the way they're thinking what what's on their mind and um so i think isaiah is on their mind um as they're writing and um what i wanted to point out here just for these few things and chris you jump in here now uh there appears to be some things we're just going to look at 32 and 35 but i'm going to read verses out of 29 and 42 also but these things all seem to be tied together in the poetry of isaiah that's influencing how the new testament is is uh presenting jesus uh of course the idea of the blind receiving their sight so that's a big deal and so isaiah 29 32 42 35 they've all they've all got that thinking in it but always tied together with the blind receiving their sight is the hope for the coming messianic king who is also the Lord himself and who is also the servant of the Lord who will pay the price for man's sin. So those concepts are all linked together in the poetry of Isaiah. You can see in chapter 29, on that day, the deaf will hear words of a book. That sounds familiar. The blind see, the deaf hear. Out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Now, this is more the kind of imagery at the end of John where you can see now. You couldn't see before, but now you can. Your eyes have been opened. It makes me think of Luke 24 when Jesus was teaching the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He says, he opened their eyes so that they could understand what he was talking about. Um, Isaiah 32 starts off, Behold, a king will reign righteously, and princes will rule justly. The hope of a coming king who reigns righteously. 
Um, and then you can see the second big thing here uh, thematically is, so, so one is the hope of the Lord coming, who is the Messianic King, who is the servant of the Lord, who pays the price for man's sin um, in the Isaiah poetry. The second thing is uh, the hope of restoration, a new creation, the new heavens and the new earth kind of language. And you can see it here in, uh, in Isaiah 32. Um, Each will be like a refuge from the wind, a shelter from the storm. And then it ties together. See how it's tying together this restoration language, the land and the people. And it's all kind of one thing restored. These people in this case are like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. Um, over here in Isaiah 35, uh, I think it's the poems thinking more about specifically the land itself. The wilderness and the desert will be glad. The desert land, the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Um, so, and then um, in um, Isaiah 42, so this is one of the servant uh poems or servant songs, the four famous servant songs of Isaiah. Um, the one that we know the best, that I know the best is Isaiah 53. Uh, this is um, the first one. Um, so 42, 49. Um, so here's what it says. To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. So it's beautiful imagery in Isaiah 42 of captives and prisoners and people being able to see and coming out of captivity. All of that, I think, feeds into um, the expectation that Jesus walks right straight into. In Luke chapter 4, when he announces himself, this is the way he starts it. He, he quotes from Isaiah 61. And the language of Isaiah 61 is really familiar um, to these poems. So I put that slide in. This is from a couple of weeks ago. Second slide. Here it says, uh, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring gospel, nibbasar, uh, good news to the afflicted. That's the word for poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And if you look in the <clears throat> in the portion over to the right, this is how Jesus announces himself in the Gospel of Luke. He quotes from this. And can you see the red part I've got in the Luke? So um, in Luke's Gospel, he adds this phrase to the Isaiah 61, the recovery of sight to the blind. So it's important. Um, the way the way John and Luke and Matthew are all presenting Jesus to us um, is heavily invested, I think, heavily tied up in the poetry of Isaiah. And Jesus walks on the scene and he is fulfilling all of this, all of these poetic images, um, bringing them to be in his presence um, in himself. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is. Um, I'm not going to tell you, Chrissy doesn't know yet, so uh, I'm not going to tell you what specific place in Matthew's gospel that today's lesson's from, but all of this imagery about the Messianic servant and receiving sight to the blind and the restoration of all things and the prisoners being set free and all, all that kind of language, um, I'm going to highlight it. Um, specifically in Isaiah 61. So I find it interesting that when in Luke's presentation of Jesus, when Jesus comes onto the scene, this is the first thing he says. So um, in our heads now, Jesus comes onto the scene in the other gospels. How, how, does, how is he presented and what does he say? So I think after I've been looking and thinking and reading this, I, I think they're very, it's very similar uh, in the, uh, the images that are presented about him, who he is, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to highlight those. So <clears throat> um, this is uh, 
This is the way Luke does it. In Luke chapter 4, this is slide 3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he quotes, and then the recovery of sight to the blind is a phrase that's not in the Masoretic text. Um, we talked about that before, and the Septuagint and all the other manuscripts and what's left out, and what's and that'll make your head go brrrr. But anyway, um, there it is in Luke chapter 4. Um, here is Isaiah 61 again, okay, the one that Jesus quotes from. But this time I've highlighted some different words in the poem. Okay, so I'm just going to read through it, highlight these words, and then I'm going to pause at the end and say, okay, does that make you think of anything you've heard Jesus talk about right at the beginning or at a key moment in his teaching um, in the New Testament? Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Highlight afflicted. So the Hebrew word there is ana, um, anav, and it, you see what it means there? The bowed, the one who's bowing, it is the poor, the afflicted, the humble, the meek. Yeah? Okay, so I started to put a bunch of verses in that have this translated humble and meek and afflicted, but I just want you to see the full span of the meaning of that word. Next phrase. So Christy's smiling. Y'all can't see her, but she's smiling already because she already knows where this is. Bells are going off. Okay, so uh, next phrase. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Literally, that word, uh, the verb shavar in Hebrew, means literally the one who is broken in pieces, the shattered. That's what the word means. The one who is smashed. Um, continuing, to proclaim liberty to the captives. You remember we did a whole thing on that. So that Hebrew word Doror there, that's, that's the year of Jubilee. <laughs> Everybody goes free. <laughs> Liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Okay, here comes the next emphasis. Christy's already flipping in her Bible. Y'all can't see her, but she's already looking this up. Uh, to comfort all who mourn. So you see that Hebrew word there, Abel, and this is the person who is in mourning. Um, it, can, it can refer to the one who's mourning over someone who's died. This is the grieving, the weeping, the mourning, the grieving, the weeping one, the one who is in mourning. To grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. Praise or joy or gladness. I think I've got that on the wrong word. Oh well. Uh, so, uh, sasson, joy or jubilation. Great happiness. So they will be called oaks of righteousness. And the Hebrew word for righteousness, Christy might remember our first Hebrew vocab. Yeah. Sadakah, yeah, or uh, the, the root here, sedek, which means the correct thing, the right thing. And I, I thought it might be useful to put some verses in here. I didn't, so I'll just tell you. Um, this word for righteousness this word means, um, it literally means to put into right relationship. So when the Bible says that God is righteous and he acts in righteousness, it means that he's doing the right thing, but specifically he's doing the right thing in terms of his promise in his relationship to his people. 
That's what righteousness means. It's his, it's his faithfulness, his loyalty to the covenant that he's made to bring about what he said he's going to bring about. Um, the way to think about it in terms of righteousness, um, in terms of people and their relationship with each other, um, a good way to say it would be like, um, if you know somebody who's, um, I try to think of the way to say it, um, <clears throat> so, um, well, I can think of two or three illustrations and they'll take a while to unfold. But if you have somebody who, who treats someone else well, and you happen to say, you know, they did right by that person. So when, when I hear the word righteousness, what I think is um, morally pure. But the word really means the way relationships are done. So God is righteous toward us. Whenever we act in righteousness, we are acting in relationship to others in a correct way. We think of, in our culture, righteousness is a state of being, but this is more of a, a relationship action going on all the time. It's a, Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, it just sounds like such a church word, mm -hmm. righteousness, um, but it has real it has real implications for how humans interact with each other and God interacts with humans and how humans interact with God. Righteousness is proper relationship. I guess you could think of it in a way of like parents disciplining their children where the child may do something wrong and they discipline, but yet they come back and have a conversation about uh, the child might be upset with them, but they're trying to help them understand why all of that had to go on, mm. the discipline, yeah. because they love them, to build that relationship back, where the child doesn't understand, but the parent's helping them understand, huh. to create that, yeah. that right relationship again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great illustration. Um, and then, uh, next phrase, the planting of the Lord. So these people who are the oaks of righteousness are going to be the planting of the Lord. Um, uh, Chrissy's smiling because we talked about this a lot a few months ago. Um, and then, uh, it says in verse seven, I skipped a couple verses there in the interest of time. Instead of shame, your shame, you will have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Uh, their portion? Okay. A double portion? Uh, next phrase. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. Now, the word there for land um, is specifically the Hebrew word eretz. And sometimes in the Old Testament, it's translated land. Uh, sometimes it's translated earth. So when, when a person reads the Old Testament, they need to be careful as to what this word means. When they read the word earth, there's another Hebrew word for, for the whole world or earth, um, or whether they mean a specific place on the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to go into that here. Um, it's a, it's a really fun rabbit trail to chase, but um, just suffice it to say here um, that very often in the old Testament, whenever you see this word land or very often when you see the word earth, the author is not thinking about the whole globe. The author's thinking about a very specific place. And ultimately that place, if you walk it backwards, um, you can walk all the way back into Genesis to the place, the land where the Garden of Eden was. So this is another kind of reference um, to force us to think about the hope of restoration making all things new again 
like they were in the Garden of Eden. So this is the kind of imagery that I think is supposed to come to our mind, this everlasting joy, a double portion in the land. I think that's supposed to come up in our heads. Okay. So um, let's, uh, let's fill in a couple more gaps, and then I'm going to stop and ask Christy because she's already turned to it. I'm going to stop and ask Christy where she thinks this is all headed. So I've, I've read Isaiah 61 this time, and I've gone... Emphasizing this time, emphasizing uh, poor, humble, meek, shattered in pieces, mourning, joy and jubilation, and righteousness. And then receiving a double portion of the land. I've highlighted those things, okay? All right. So now uh, let's just take a couple of these to... Um, I want to make my head think about um, the details of the Isaiah presentation. So um, Isaiah 61, the first phrase, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, I'm not going to go through this again, but um, this, this is a great, I, I, do you see the slide here, Chris? It's slide number five. Mm -hmm. we, we went through that one in detail before. You can walk through the book of Isaiah tracking this one who the Spirit of the Lord God is upon. Um, and you can see that um, in this first servant song, Isaiah 42, it says that his servant has had the Spirit put on him. And you see the last phrase there? To bring out prisoners, to open blind eyes. Okay, so these the poetry through the book of Isaiah is all interwoven, connected together as you're walking through. So when Jesus reads from Isaiah 61, I think we're supposed to go link, 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 link backwards all the way through the book of Isaiah. He is the fulfillment of the whole story. Okay. Um, so I want you to see that language again there for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Um, specifically, it says, next slide, Slide six, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. So we've done this before. Yeah. Uh, so the Hebrew word here, basar, the root, um, basar, to bring good news or good tidings. This verse in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation, is the word euangelion or gospel or good news. And this is this good news word here, the good news of the afflicted is the word that shows up in the New Testament as euangelion, the good news. Now, in, in the poem that leads into the Isaiah 53 passage, you know, the lamb who was slaughtered, um, God was pleased to, to inflict him. He was pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquities. In that poem, it says in verse 7, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings gospel, good news, who announces shalom, peace. And remember that Hebrew word peace doesn't mean uh, war. It does mean that. Yeah, but it's more than that. It's everything's made right. Yes. So to say shalom in Hebrew, means not only do I hope that you're not in any conflict, but I hope that, that your relationships with everyone in your world and everything around you are just right, all restored. That's what the word carries with it, shalom. So this one announces good news, gospel, peace, and brings good news, that's the word gospel again, of happiness. My Bible says happiness, but you see what the Hebrew word there is? Good. Good news of the good. Yeah? Who announces, this one um, will make your hair stand up on the back of your neck. Who announces salvation. Um, and I'll pronounce it. Yeshua. That's, that's Jesus' name. <laughs> yeah. Who announces salvation and says to God, says to Zion, your God reigns. The Lord is king. 
This is the good news. Now, when Jesus arrives on the scene, he is announcing the gospel. Yes, the good news. Um, do you remember um, the inscription we looked at about the gospel thing? I asked the college kids, I asked you guys one day in class, I said, I want you, just before we start, just write it on a piece of paper. It, when I say the word gospel, in two sentences, what would you say? Now, I, what I would say is, Jesus came, he paid the price for sin, he's resurrected, and he will give me salvation. Forgive me of my sins so that I can live with him forever. That, that's the way I would have worded it. But this is another one of those times where I think whenever we hear the word gospel, are we hearing it the same way the writer intended for us to hear it? Um, and I think, I mean, we can go on and read and, you know, continue reading and you get the sense of it. But the first reader, you know, of Matthew's gospel or Mark's gospel, and they read this, the gospel, you know, Jesus comes announcing the gospel. What, what are the things that come to their mind? Well, I think this, this business here, the Lord reigning and God is king and the Messiah has come and the prisoners are set free and the blind receive their sight and all the captives are, and there's um, salvation and there's the restored land. And there, these are the images I think that are supposed to fill our minds whenever we read about that. Um, for sure, for sure, to hear this word euangelium to the original readers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would have come across more about the Lord reigning than it does for me. I don't know about you, but um, I, my, the, my first inclination whenever I hear gospel is to think Jesus died for me. And I think that's right. <laughs> But I think the first inclination when one of the first readers of the Gospels heard the word, or when Jesus stands in front of them and says, I'm preaching the Gospel, repent, for the, for the kingdom of God is here. What they would have heard would have been a little different, I think. So I'll put that slide back in here again. If you look at slide number seven, um, I only have three more slides, and I'm done. So this was the Perini calendar inscription that was discovered. Um, archaeological dig dates to about 9 BC. So this is before Jesus, and it's talking about the birthday of Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And he uses this word gospel. And it's not talking about this man dying for their sins. When, when they heard the gospel of the kingdom, this is the kind of thing that would have been, I think, that would have been in their heads. So... Um, it's, you, see, you can see here uh, the, the language is eerie, eerily familiar. I've got Caesar underlined, Caesar by his appearance, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God, Augustus, was the beginning of the euangelion for the world that came by reason of him. So this is... This is the culture that Jesus steps into. And he says, I have it over here in Mark 115, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So um, help me say that, the gospel. So it's not only the salvation of the individual, it's the salvation of their nation and the promises that were made to them. And what about what about how they would have been viewed? How Mark and Matthew and Luke and John and Jesus, when Jesus said these things, treason. it was absolute treason against the Roman emperor. I think these these are these are words that'll get your head cut off or hung or whatever impaled. Um. Okay. So. Um, Let's move then closer to the Sunday school verses for this week. Um, so this slide is one that we looked at before about how Matthew presents Jesus. 
All right. So uh, in Matthew chapter, I've got it at the top. Uh, we were talking about the kingdom of heaven before. Matthew 4, Jesus is going about in Galilee, and it says, I've got it number one. He's teaching in the synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So this is right, you know, this is right toward the end of chapter four. And then secondly, he's healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So first up, um, let's do number two. So the healing of every kind of disease and sickness among the people, does that fit the messianic image? Blind see, deaf hear, lame walk, captives set free. He, he's making, he's, he is in the business of restoration. Okay. Um, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, so I've got them numbered one and two in the boxes right here. And you can see, if you look in your Bible in Matthew chapter five, if you flip through the first couple of chapters there, Matthew five, Matthew six, Matthew seven, um, I'll let Chris do that. Oh, you don't have the red letters. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So I'm doing it here so you can see it. So Matthew chapter 5. So put this up here. You see all the red letters? <laughs> okay, so in my Bible, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. It's Jesus talking. And so Matthew presents to us, he, he puts Jesus in front of us and he says, um, this is what he's doing. He's teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel kingdom. So you say, okay, well, what was he teaching? What was Jesus saying about the gospel of the kingdom? So he records it for us. For three chapters, we can read what he was saying. And then... Number two, he's healing every kind of disease. In Matthew chapter 8 and 9, he heals the leper, the centurion servant, Peter's mother-in-law, many who are demon-possessed. It says all who are ill, a paralytic, a woman who touches his garment, the synagogue officials, a blind man, two blind men, demon-possessed dumb man. So it looks to me like Matthew very much on purpose sets this up. This is, this is who Jesus is. He has brought, he is, he's going to tell you what the gospel of the kingdom is, and then he's going to um, practice that with his healing ministry. And then uh, when you get into Matthew chapter 9, you see verse 35, he says there, Jesus was going about all the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. It's the exact same word. In it. So this is the way Hebrew dudes write. They, so you've got a bookmark, and then in between, he fills out the story. Literary genius. Okay. So um, next slide. This is the last one that I'm going to read the Sunday school lesson and then shut up. Okay. So he says um, uh, in Matthew 3, 2 and Matthew 4, 17, just before he goes to start his teaching, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, so first off, I've got it in the box. My New American Standard says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, so this Greek word here, out of logos, is in the perfect active indicative, third person singular. See that? So if I click on perfect here in logos, this is what it tells me. The verb tense used by the writer to describe a completed verbal action that occurred in the past, but which produced a state or being, sorry, a state of being or a result that exists in the present in relation to the writer. And it goes on. Um, in Luke 15, the same word is used. It says, um, don't, don't think about the story, but just think about the word I've got it highlighted. The tax collectors and sinners were coming near him. That's the same phrase, is at hand. In uh, James 4, 8, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Drawing near. Matthew 21, 
when they had approached Jerusalem. So um, when I say, whenever I, whenever I read Jesus' statement, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what exactly is he saying? Is the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, it can mean to come near or draw near or approach or to come or to draw. Is that helping any at all? The kingdom of heaven is drawn near. Maybe the simplest way to say it would be the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Specifically, I'm here. Now, when he says that in Luke chapter 4, when, he, when he's presented at the beginning of Luke chapter 4 and he's quoting Isaiah 61, um, he doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is here. He quotes from Isaiah 61. And so to him, what does it look like? We should say, I think what we should say is, when the kingdom of God comes, in the poetic presentation of Jesus from Isaiah, what does that look like? I think that's why when Jesus quoted from Isaiah with John's question, John, I mean, that was it, man. That answered his question. He's the one. What does it look like? What is this kingdom? What, what does it look like? And so this, this imagery of the Messianic figure from Isaiah is really influencing this. The kingdom's here. So now... And it's in stark contrast to any other kingdom there ever was. Yeah. So... Yeah, and it was, it was shocking to so many of them in the New Testament, but not to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his disciples, Jesus' disciples were like some of the ones who didn't get it <laughs> at first. They, they just, they, they, had, they had a different image about the kingdom of God in their head. Their Jesus was going to destroy the Romans. Um, okay, so I want to say more about that um, just yet. Um, I wanted to say one more thing before we read it. Okay, so um, now it's time for the question. So let me go back to the verses here. So just the kingdom's here. And uh, Christy was turning to Matthew a minute ago, so I'm not going to make her answer the question. But I'm going to go back to this 61, Isaiah 61 thing here. This is slide four, Chris. You want to look at it again with me? Uh, so the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's linking the servant in Isaiah. It's linking back to the seed from the line of David in Isaiah 11. This is the Messianic king. Um, you could easily make the case that the spirit of the Lord God is upon him, and he is the Lord. You could do that in these poems. Um, and then I emphasized he's bringing the gospel to the poor, to the humble, to the meek, to the shattered, to the mourning. He's bringing joy. He is calling them oaks of righteousness, and they are to receive a double portion of the earth or the land. Okay, so I emphasize those on purpose out of Isaiah 61 because I think Jesus most famous teaching is recasting these images of the people who are the people of the kingdom of God. So I'll just read it and that'll be it. So to the last slide, Jesus was going through Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, 
and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, it should be pointed out here before I read the rest of this. There's only a couple of disciples that Jesus has already called in terms of the 12. In Matthew's gospel, the big list doesn't come for like five more chapters, Matthew 10. Just a couple of them here. Like um, it says that he's got in verse 18 of Matthew 4, Simon and Andrew. And then going on, it says two other brothers, James and John. So, and uh, when it says large crowds followed him and Jesus saw, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. It could mean that just those four, but I think it's much more likely that it means that all these people that he had been healing and teaching and talking about the kingdom with, these were in his mind the people of the kingdom. And they were with him. They're sitting there to hear him teach. The these are the broken, the poor, the humble, the, you see why I emphasize all those words out of Isaiah 61? So I'm going to say this, um, it's never been told to me this way, but I think more now that I've been thinking and, and reading and thinking about this, I, I do not think that this, that these words of Jesus here are him looking at the reader of this saying, you better be this and you better be that and you better do this and you better do that. I don't think that's the words that are coming out of his mouth. He's talking to these people who he has healed. They are, it tells you, they are the ones who were ill and diseased and epileptics and paralytics and his disciples. I mean, okay, so this is who he's talking to. And here's what he says. Another thing is he said it on the mountain. Yeah, he's on the mountain. That's right. Yes. <laughs> the intro, you saw that one. That one jumped out at me too. He, what? He goes up on the mountain? Really? So you mean Moses? Okay. So his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just imagine how that how that landed on these people. They, they, are, they are the ones whose voices are ignored. They are not in leadership positions. They are not in position that, they are the Isaiah 61 crowd <laughs> that he's talking to. Blessed are those who mourn they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. I think about the oaks of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become ta tasteless, how can it be made salty again? I got a whole chemistry thing on sodium chloride here that we're not going to do. Um, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So there is some, I think there is some language of warning here, but I think his words here are another way of saying that the poems of Isaiah have been fulfilled in him. And their words, I think these are words that would have been incredibly encouraging to the crowd of people who were sitting there listening to him. Good enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Yeah. You want to add something, Chris? Add something. That's all I got. Um, there's there's 10 blessings to... Uh, nine. Nine? Oh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. I counted those. There are nine okay. of them. Yeah. I don't know. I chased, I chased that rabbit for a little bit, but I couldn't really get anything that really hit me hard. But... Y'all have a good week.